like if you've got a piece of a chromosome that's broken and it's gone, it's no longer there, deletions. Now here's the one I think you learned about this in the computer tutorial, didn't you? Free du Yeah. Who's taking French? Anybody taking French? What's Cree du Chat mean? Cry of the cat. Right. Cat cry syndrome. And the reason it's called that is newborn babies that have this condition, when they cry, it sounds like this. That's what it sounds like. Because the vocal cords are slightly abnormally developed. That's what, that's what it sounds like. Cat cry syndrome. Yes, sir. Can they speak normally? Yeah, eventually as they get a little as they get older. Does it have the same like um, abnormal tone in it? No. No. But as babies, as newborns, that's that's kind of what it sounds like. Cat cry syndrome. This is an example of a deletion. How many chromosomes does this child have? How many chromosomes? Forty-five. Uh, Forty-five point nine. Forty-six. Oh, what? It's misleading. It is misleading. The, the Y is all the way to the bottom. Yeah, the, oh, the Y is all all the way down here, right? The X is up there. Yeah. I, yeah. Okay. okay. So this is a little boy. This is this is a little boy. This is the same little boy when he was a baby. Okay. Cat cry syndrome. Preview shot. Sometimes it's called 5P minus. Anybody want to take a guess as to why it's called 5P minus? Yeah, they're missing a P as part of the podcast. Excellent. They're missing a piece of the P arm on chromosome 5. See right there with, oh, there's the arrow. That's handy. There's the arrow. Tiny little piece of the P arm of chromosome 5 is blown away. It's missing. Maybe it broke when either mom or dad was doing meiosis. And when those chromosomes get pulled apart during meiosis, they're pulled apart by those spindle fibers, sometimes they just accidentally break. And then you get a piece missing, a deletion. Can you think of anything else that might? Break a chromosome. Tough question. Certain harmful drugs can possibly do that. What else? Radiation. Radiation can break chromosomes. What else? Chemicals. Excellent. Certain harsh chemicals can break chromosomes. All right. Um, Raise your hand if you've been to the dentist in the last year. All right, hands down. In the last year, did they put, did they raise your hand if they took x-rays? Okay, hands down. Raise your hand if before they took x-rays, they put like this heavy lead-lined apron on your body. No, sometimes they don't. Because it was a full body, I mean full face. Oh, okay. Why did they do that? Why, why did they put, yeah? To protect the radiation. To protect your body from radiation. Mm -hmm. You ever notice the x-ray technician, before she takes the picture of your jaw, or they put these things in your mouth, it's like. Yeah. And they expect you to talk with all that stuff in your mouth? Yeah. Uh, so how was your day today? <laughs> So anyway, have you ever noticed how the x-ray technician, before she takes the picture, she'll leave the room, right? Then she'll push a button and you hear it, it takes a picture, and then she'll come back in. That's because she's doing that, I don't know how many times a day, how many, I don't know how many x-rays a day she would probably take, lots of them. And she just wants to avoid overexposure to those x-rays. Now that's... That, obviously, that's a different form of radiation than nuclear radiation. But x-rays and nuclear radiation can potentially damage chromosomes, break chromosomes. 
Yes. That's why if you ever go, like if you have a suspected broken bone or something and you go to get x-rays, there will be a sign or something that says, notify the technician if you may be pregnant or if you are pregnant, something like that. And the reason for that is rapidly dividing cells that are actively doing mitosis, where the chromosomes are being pulled apart, actively dividing cells are more, they're more susceptible to being damaged by, chromos by uh, radiation. The chromosomes in rapidly dividing cells. And in an embryo, you've got rapidly dividing cells. You've got cells actively doing mitosis. Does that make sense? Why you wouldn't want to get x-rays if you're pregnant? If you desperately needed an x-ray, you can bet. If you're pregnant and you desperately needed an x-ray, you can bet they would cover your, your body with those heavy lead light aprons. Now I ask, uh, I've asked a couple different dentists. So how much of a dose of radiation are you getting when you have your teeth x-rayed? And uh, in every case, actually I've asked three different dentists. And every time I've been told it's minuscule. It's like practically nothing. It's so you guys tell me, why do you think they put the lead lined apron on you then? Yeah. Right, so that if you get cancer 30 years later, you won't come back and say, I think it was because of an x-ray I got in your dentist's office 30 years ago. Protection from lawsuits, yeah. Don't they also do that to make sure you don't x-ray things if you're not trying to get x-ray? Yeah, because some of the x-rays, well, they're not all going to be directed here. I mean, uh, you could get exposure to, and it's not, I mean, I've been told, and I should probably Google and do more research on this, because how much do you trust people, but I have heard that the, the dosage that you get is so minute, it's, it's not a concern, okay? But that x-ray technician, she's going to leave the room every time because she's doing countless, countless ones in a year's time. Okay. So now sometimes, if a chromosome in a cell is exposed to radiation, okay, let's talk about nuclear nuclear radiation. You guys, have you guys had physics? Raise your hand if you. I have. Did you get into nuclear energy? Talk about nuclear energy. Hello. A little bit. What is nuclear radiation? No. Basically, what is it? Okay, like in fusion reactions, like the, uh, the reaction that happens in a hydrogen bomb, fusion reaction, okay, you've got nuclei being fused together and that creates lots of heat and energy. And, or in a fission reaction, like in an atomic bomb, you've got like, uranium atoms that are split. And then, and they give off these high energy subatomic particles that go flying out, and that's the radiation. High energy subatomic particles flying out that could hit people, hit chromosomes. That's the radiation. Now, I thought maybe it would be interesting to simulate uh, an, a chromosome right here being exposed to nuclear radiation, to high energy subatomic particles. Yeah, so I have in here, this is the chromosome, and I have right here a high energy subatomic particle being given off by a, a radioactive source. Well, you've got one too. I did too. Oh, is it NERF? Is, it, is that a hacky set? No. Nothing. Ooh, that's heavy. Yeah, you that's going to do some damage. You can't throw that. <laughs> okay. No, no. This one's a little lighter. But let's pretend that uh, I'm going to stand back here. 
<laughs> Let's pretend that I am a, uh, a chunk of uranium, okay? And so I'm giving off these high energy subatomic particles. This is the nuclear radiation. But, but they fly every which way randomly. And that's a chromosome in somebody's cell, in somebody's body who's exposed to this. Now this is a small dose, right? Only one particle that's gonna go flying at that chromosome. So we're looking at a really small dose here. And to kind of make it so that it's random, it's more like random, I'm gonna throw with my opposite hand, okay? Now, I was not a pitcher in high school. I played first base. I, I threw right-handed. So I'm going to throw with the left hand to make it more random. Okay. You ready for this? All right. So this is a low dose of radiation. Only one of these, right? You think I can hit that thing? Now, it's probably going to look funny because I'm not used to throwing left-handed, so it's going to look funny, and who knows where this thing will go. Okay, this is random. Those of you guys sitting up there, watch your heads. Okay? I mean, it's not going to hurt. It's a Nerf ball. I know what you're saying. A Nerf's a Nerf, Mr. Rule, right? Okay, this is a Nerf ball. Ready? We're going to expose. Wait, before we do that. Wait, before we do that. Let me ask you this. Do you think it's possible for something like this to happen? What? Boink. Yeah, that could happen like that, right? Like 5p minus, that could happen. Do you think it's possible for the whole chromosome to kind of be blown apart? Yes. Yeah, like if I landed right there. Yeah, you never know. Even with a low dose of radiation, you can't be sure that there's not going to be chromosome damage. The lower the dose, though, the less likely you're going to have chromosome damage, right? So, mm, oh, watch this. Do you think this is possible? Uh, let me see. Mm, it hits right here, point, and it goes... It hits right there and goes, boom. Sure. Yeah. That's possible. And you get a deletion like in the middle of the chromosome. Small piece in the middle of the chromosome is gone. Can the deletion happen naturally? Does that be only caused by Great question. Sometimes deletion, pieces of chromosomes being broken, can happen naturally. Like when they're getting pulled apart during mitosis or during meiosis. It can happen. Chromosomes have, not, not all sections of all the chromosomes are equal. Some have like fragile sites. There will be places, locations on certain chromosomes, they're called fragile sites, that are more susceptible to breaking than other places. It's called fragile sites. So, that can happen. Oh, let me ask you this. Do you think that this could happen? Watch. Um, point, it hits right there, and it's like, Why not? Yeah, that's possible. That's called an inversion mutation. Inversion. And sometimes it won't cause any damage, and sometimes it will. Because sometimes the order of the genes on this chromosome right there to Sometimes the order is important. You mess up the order and then they don't work right. So sometimes you can get this, inversion mutation. I doubt if I'm going to get that if I throw this. Mm -hmm. It's possible. Do you leave? Yeah, deal. <laughs> That's a deal. Okay, you ready? We're going to expose that chromosome to a really low dose of radiation. Here we go. Don't laugh at me throwing with my off hand, okay? It's going to look pretty ridiculous. Okay, here we go. Ready? No. Okay. Uh, that was really good. Uh, let me, how about, how about if I throw with my good hand? 
think I can do it? Yeah. yeah. You use so close your eyes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I would close my eyes and spin around and make it really random, but I'd probably curl. <laughs> All right. Let me throw with the right hand. See if I can get it. Right hand. Oh, no. It's not easy. Okay. So you said you I was not a pitcher. Where'd you go? All right. Well, yeah. oh, I have one. <laughs> okay. Well, that was a low dose. You will not believe this. One year I did this offhand, and it wiped out the whole stack of hands. No way. Yeah. It was just luck. And so that just goes to show you that sometimes even a low dose of radiation can be harmful. You just never know. But the lower the dose, the less likely you're going to have chromosome damage. Okay. Um, we used to have a teacher who taught here. He's re he retired years ago. He taught in the business department. And he was in the Navy. He was in the Navy back right after World War II. So like early 50s. What were we doing, scientifically speaking, in the early 1950s? Testing what? Testing nuclear bombs, right? Yeah. Get what? Oh, getting ready to go into space. Well, actually, the, the Russians beat us into space. They launched this first satellite called Sputnik, 1957. I remember it well. I was two years old. No, I don't remember it. Yeah, but we beat them to the moon. Yeah. It was a race. Okay, so anyway, in the early 1950s, we were testing nuclear weapons, and, uh, and, and sometimes they would uh, let off an atomic bomb on a small, isolated, uninhabited, like desert island out in the Pacific Ocean. And this teacher I was telling you about who retired years ago, his name was uh, Mr. Harley. And he said that he was in the Navy, and when they were doing that, the, all the sailors on his ship were close enough to one of those tests that they could see it. And they all put on these dark glasses because it was going to be a cool sight. Everybody knew it was going to be an awesome sight. Okay? So they all put on these dark glasses and they, they stood out on the deck against the railing and watched with these you know, really dark glasses on. I mean, it was far enough away, the mushroom cloud, when it went off, that it was supposedly safe. But hindsight's always 2020. And so they witnessed this atomic blast. Now, he told me that in the intervening years, almost all of those guys who were sailors on that ship, not all of them, but a lot, died of things like leukemia, and other cancers. And a lot of times if you have broken chromosomes, it can lead to cancers. So 2020 hindsight, right? Probably wasn't a good idea to have those guys standing on the ship watching that thing. I mean, they were miles away, but they could see it, the mushroom cloud. And so last time I heard, he has never gotten sick. So he was just lucky, right? But they were far enough away that it would have been like a really low dose, but still a dose. You with me? How might we simulate a really high dose? A bigger ball. Okay, or, that's a good idea, or a big tub of several balls. Oh, several balls. I was just going to say, hit it. Oh, yeah. Well, let's, let's simulate a really high dose of radiation, okay? So I have one in here for everybody. Oh, All right, now what we're going to do is we're going to... Well, no, we're not going to use that one. You might put somebody's eye out. No, that won't happen. You give somebody a black eye. 
but we'll all, let's, I'm going to have you guys all line up back there. We'll all throw from back there. So uh, go ahead and pass those around. Go ahead and take them back there. So yeah, let's let's simulate a really high dose. subatomic particle. Should I let you guys throw with your good hand or your off hand? Good hand. Good hand. Good hand. Good hand. Good hand. I'll tell you what. You can use whatever hand you want. Okay? Let's make it so. Uh, uh, uh. Alright. That's okay. Go for it. Now. Everybody have one? Okay. So we're going to count. We're going to count to three and then throw. Now this is a this is a really high dose of radiation, like oh, raise your hand if you ever saw the movie Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull. Oh, that movie! Remember when he got inside the refrigerator? Yeah. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Well, let's let's say it's that kind of a dose. You're that close. Really high dose of radiation. You're just dying to throw up right now, aren't you? With these things. <laughs> okay. Really high dose of radiation. So I'll count to three, and then you throw. Now wait. Time out. Is it possible that this chromosome might survive? Yes. yes. It probably will. <laughs> not not as likely as if it were just a single high energy particle, right? <laughs> But the higher the dose, the more likely you're going to get some chromosome damage. Okay, we're going to count to three. Wait a minute. Do we go one, two, three, and then throw? Yeah. yeah. Or throw on three? One, two, three, throw. Okay, one, two. Wait, we'll that's what we're going to do. I'll say one, two, three, and then you throw. Okay. One, two, three, say throw. Yeah. You want me to say oh, yeah. throw? Yeah. yeah like, All right. Throw. Here we go. Wind up. Okay. One, two, three, throw. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, jeepers. For, for a minute. Uh, for a minute, I thought, oh my gosh, it survived this intense high dose of radiation. And then you do the last one. Oh, nice work. Well, you get the idea, right? Sorry, you get the idea? Yeah. All right, now you get, let's pick up, try to find all of the balls. It's like an Easter egg hunt now, right? Yay. See what I find you uh, Oh, no. I no jelly beans either. Uh, <laughs> Nice girl. I'm impressed. Did you really try it? I can't do it all. You're good. That's pretty cool. Goodness. Where's that bag? Thank you for picking those up over there. Some of them got clear over there. Crazy. Seriously, when I saw all those balls miss, I thought, you have got to be crazy. Usually, with all those balls, that high dose of energy, you get major chromosome damage. Usually. Huh? Any more uh, Nerf balls? I'll probably find one or two around later today. That's usually what happens. 
Just like sometimes you find a stray Easter egg that somebody didn't yeah. find, you find it like in October or something. I found an Easter egg like that's ever happened. five years later. <laughs> you found an Easter egg five years later? Yeah, it was pretty, it's pretty nasty. It was really, really nasty. Where was it? It was behind yeah. our couch. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, we got a good handle on deletions, I think, don't we? All right. Deletion. Let's look at another kind of chromosome accident. Euploidy. Oh, remember that? What's you mean, eat you? Good. Good or true. So we're talking true multiples of the haploid set of chromosomes. Okay, true multiples. Now, there's an example of a euploid karyotype. Actually, that's triploid. Three sets of chromosomes. Can you see them? The, uh, like if you look at chromosome pair number six, see how there are three of them? Uh, there's, that's a drawing right next to them of a chromosome six. You got three of everything, see that? Three of everything. T-R-I, triploid. Is this an animal or just a human? That's a great question. This is a karyotype made from a miscarried embryo. Gee. A miscarried embryo that happened to be triploid. That's what this is. Wow. And as it turns out, see it was XXY. That's triploid. But let's look at these for a second. Okay, haploid or monoploid in that's euploid, right? One times n. Is haploid normal? No. Presumptive. If it's in a sperm or an egg, right? That's the way sperms and eggs are supposed to be, right? Haploid. Uh, diploid. Is that normal? Yes. Hope so. Because your body cells are diploid, right? Two sets of n. Two sets of 23. Two times 23. True multiple of n. Sometimes you get polyploid. What? Wait, wait. What's poly mean? Many. Many. Polyploid. A couple of different kinds of polyploidy here. Three n triploidy, four n tetraploidy. Yeah. Four sets of chromosomes would be tetraploid. Five would be pentaploid. Right? There are some plants. Uh, some ferns. The plants get weird. There are some fern plants that have like a hundred sets of chromosomes. Major polyploids. And uh, if you find in the, sometimes in the grocery store you'll see really large fruits, that, I mean bigger than normal, like strawberries that are ginormous. Or apples that are really big, those are probably polyploid. Because um, people who, researchers who produce new varieties of crops and vegetables and fruits and things like that, they can on purpose make certain plants polyploid and it makes their fruits bigger than normal. So in plants, it's not lethal. In humans, it's lethal. Okay, like this, that's, like I said, that's a uh, karyotype of a miscarried fetus that was triploid. Uh, humans, when they're triploid or tetraploid, they cannot live. Yeah. Are all of the plants genes like drastically different? So like, I mean, could you, it's hard to explain. Does the gene on like an apple to make it grow large, like the fruit's larger, is it the same on like, I don't know. Oh, there are a lot of similarities between the, the genes between apples and pears. But that's not like, it's not like a No, but there are, there are some genes, there are quite a few genes that plants have that are also common, the exact same genes in, in animals and in, in including humans. But there's one in particular that just popped into my head. Um, you all have this enzyme in your saliva. It's an enzyme called amylase. 
And what it does is it breaks starch down into sugar molecules that your cells can use. So like if you eat a cracker or those little fish things, you know, they have a lot of starch in them. And in your mouth, the digestion process starts right away. So the enzyme in your saliva called amylase, it's a protein, it's an enzyme, breaks the starch molecules down into sugar molecules, which then it'll ultimately get delivered to the cells in your body. And then your cells are able to take those sugar, specifically glucose molecules, and use them for energy. But uh, bananas have amylase in them also. The exact same protein, the exact same enzyme, made by the exact same gene. So that's a gene that bananas have and you and I have. A gene that makes that enzyme called amylase. Katie, you're getting ready to say something. Why is it that plants are like so resistant? Like, so they're like they are so they're tolerant of the genetic changes that would like kill people around there. That's a great question. I don't know. <laughs> My educated guess is it has to do with how complex the organism is. I don't mean to sound like a, a mammal chauvinist, okay? But mammals, and especially humans, are pretty complex. I mean, okay, simpler, I hate to use the word simple animals because any living thing that's alive today is the product of, you know, three and a half billion years of biological evolution. So, but we still talk about some animals being simpler than others. Like, I think I'm more complex than a round worm. And, and I know I'm more complex than a crayfish. Okay, a crayfish, if it loses a claw, for example, it can regenerate a whole new claw. If I lost my arm, I would not be able to regenerate a whole new arm. It's just that much more complex. All the bones, all the muscles, all the nerves, all the blood vessels and everything has to do with complexity. So, yeah, the more complex the organism, the, the less able it is to tolerate genetic changes like polyploid. Did I see another hand going up over here? Now, this polyploidy stuff, this reminds me Several years ago, I went over to Purdue to the animal science department, and I, I had a few students with me, and we were visiting a professor in the animal science department who was doing research on catfish, and they were making triploid catfish on purpose. And triploid catfish live. They don't die like triploid human embryos do. Triploid catfish do just fine. They do just fine. You know how they were making the triploid catfish? Catfish with three sets of chromosomes. They had these, in the lab, they had these big vats. Uh, they looked like above ground swimming pools. About You've seen those round above ground swimming pools. About half the size of a typical round above ground swimming pool made of metal with all kinds of temperature controls and things on them. And they had this, uh, they had these catfish growing in these tanks. And some of these catfish were pretty big. They'd swim around the tanks. And what they would do is they would take like uh, a female catfish that was getting ready to lay eggs. A female catfish that was gravid. In other words, all ready to lay eggs. And they would get her up out of this tank and put her over a new tank that just had water in it and no other fish in it. And they would manipulate her body in such a way that all the eggs would come spraying out of her body into this tank. And then they would take her and toss her back into the tank that she came from. And she's like, what happened? And then they would take a male catfish that was ready to spawn. Okay, that's what spawning, that's what it's called when a male fish hovers over a nest of eggs and sprays the sperm cells out over the nest of eggs. 
spawning. A lot of fish. When they make babies, it's like the female will, with her tail, make a like a nest at the bottom of the pond, and she'll lay her eggs in that nest, and then she'll swim off. She may wink at the male. I'm just kidding. They don't really do that. Then the male comes along. She's gone. He hovers over the nest, and the sperm cells come spraying out, and they settle down onto the eggs in that nest. Then he swims off, and then those sperms fertilize those eggs right there in the nest, and that's spawning, okay? Very different than the way mammals do it, as you well know. Well, so they, they would take the male, put him over the tank that had all the eggs in it, and they would manipulate his body so the sperm cells would come spraying out, and then toss him back to the tank. And then he's like, what happened? Not really, but bear with me. And then they would like stir those sperms and eggs together in that tank. But they had temperature controls on it. So they could lower the temperature real suddenly, real fast. They called that cold shocking the eggs. So they would cold shock the eggs. And they discovered that when they did that, when they lowered the temperature real fast, when a sperm went into the egg, that cold temperature, that sudden temperature drop, would prevent that egg from kicking out the last polar body. Remember oogenesis? Remember? Remember that? How the egg does meiosis one, kicks out a polar body, and then if a sperm gets into it, does meiosis two, kicks out another polar body, right? Cold shocking the eggs prevented the polar body from leaving after it was fertilized. So here's what happened then. You have the egg with a set of chromosomes. The sperm contributes a set of chromosomes. The polar body that forgot to leave contributes a set of chromosomes. So you get a fertilized catfish egg with three sets of chromosomes. I thought that was really cool. But the coolest part, are you, are you with me? How they made those triploid catfish? The coolest part was, he said, Joe, come over here. I want, I, want you, I, want to, I want you to see something. And he, with a net, he dipped out a catfish, like a normal diploid catfish, that was about this long. This is not a fish story, this is true. Normal diploid catfish about this long. Then he dipped out from another tank a triploid catfish that was the same age, fed the same amount of food over the same amount of time, and that triploid catfish was like, watch this, that one. They grow bigger and faster than normal on the same amount of food. Triploid catfish. Oh, oh my God, this is really cool. They're sterile. Their, their testes and ovaries are not completely developed. So all, all the energy that would have gone into the development of reproductive organs instead goes into the development of flesh, muscle, growth, sterile. Still kind of cool, triploid. See, it's not lethal in catfish like it is in humans, but I was amazed. I couldn't believe it. And people who own catfish farms. I don't know if there are any catfish farms around here. I think in the south there are more where the farmers, instead of growing corn or soybeans, they have these big ponds where they grow, they raise catfish, right? And they sell them to like restaurants, places like that. Have any of you ever had catfish at a restaurant? Chances are it came from a catfish farm somewhere. They, they raise them in these big ponds. Eli, you look like you were thinking of something to say. No, no. I just found it really funny how you oh. compared it to growing corn. Oh, yeah. yeah. So anyway, can you see how catfish farmers would... Wait a minute. Is anybody picturing a catfish with farmer clothing on? <laughs> yes. On. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. Can you imagine why a cat
catfish farmer would be interested in a, uh, a type of catfish, triploid catfish, that would grow bigger and faster than normal in the same time period on the same amount of feed? Can you see? They taste the same. I'm, to I'm told. They taste the same. Somebody, uh, somebody in the trip when I went to Purdue and I saw that setup. Somebody said, "Well, what happens if they accidentally get loose and they they get out in the wild? Is that going to mess up the ecosystem?" And he said, "Well, they are sterile. So they can't reproduce." But Dr. Malcolm from Jurassic Park would probably say, "Look." Life finds a way. So, anyway, raise your hand if you had ever heard of triploid catfish before, before this day. Don't you feel enriched? Yeah. I think it's kind of cool, triploid catfish. Now, sometimes triploid happens in humans. You guys learned about that in the computer lesson, right? Now, I think you saw. Did you see a photograph of a rare? Triploid newborn baby. Wasn't there a photograph in there? It is normally impossible. The reason that one happened was because it was something that we call a mosaic. In other words, the baby's body was a mixture of triploid cells and normal cells. A mosaic. And uh, Enough of the cells were normal that the baby went full term, but then died shortly after birth. So, so sometimes triploidy happens in humans. What would be one cause that you can think of? Excellent. The polar body forgets to leave. Now we got to put quotation marks around forget, right? Sperm enters the egg. The egg's supposed to do meiosis two supposed to kick out that last polar body, but sometimes, for some reason, that polar body might not exit the egg, it stays inside, so you get a set of chromosomes from the egg, a set from the sperm, a set from the polar body. The most common way, though, is two sperms, right, a photo finish between two sperm cells. Two sperm cells enter the egg at exactly the same instant. Then the zona around it hardens, and no other sperms can get in. There's a name for that. It's called dispermy. That's a new name, right? A new word. Dispermy. So when two sperm cells get into the egg at exactly the same instant. Dispermy. But what happens to that fertilized egg? Dies dies maybe within a day or two even. Maybe sometime during that first week when it's traveling through the fallopian tube on its way to the uterus. I would guess, I would bet that whenever that happens, mom's maybe one or two or maybe three days late on her period. She thinks, am I pregnant? And then menstruation happens. Oh, I'm just late. That could happen. Okay. How about tetraploid? Occasionally, in rare instances, you get an embryo that's tetraploid or sets of chromosomes. How do you think that might happen? To uh, a sperm and egg cathode. Oh, you're talking non-disjunction at each of the 23 pairs of chromosomes? Yeah, now remember, non-disjunction is not real likely, like the 221s fail to separate. It's, it's not too likely that you're going to have non-disjunction happen for each of the 23 pairs of chromosomes. But could you imagine three sperms getting into an egg? That's possible. Here's another way it could happen. Okay? 
watch this. Here's another way it can happen. Here's a fertilized egg. I heard somebody once call it a ziggit. It's not a ziggit. It's not a ziggit. It's a zygote. Okay? In fact, everybody in the world needs to hear that. Not a zygot, it's a zygote. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a kind of. What if they didn't hear you? Don't look like what we might hear the camera right now. Oh, yeah. we just have to do the best we can. Zygote, okay, so here's a fertilized egg. <laughs> fertilized egg, 46 chromosomes in there. Is that normal? No. 46 chromosomes. It's a fertilized egg. Zygote. It's got 46 chromosomes. Yeah, that's normal. Now watch. It's going to do its first mitosis division to become a two-celled embryo. Here we go. See? Two-celled embryo. 46 and 46. Normal two-celled embryo, right? Now it's going to do mitosis again to become a four-celled embryo. Molly, look at this. You all right? You're not visible on the camera, and nobody knows who you are. I admire, actually, I admire you guys. Look at you. You're paying attention. It's black four, the day before fall break. It's been a long stretch from Labor Day to now. You're doing it. You're not all snoring or drooling on your desk. That's a good thing. <laughs> what? Oh. Okay, looky here. Watch, you get a mistake in mitosis. You guys, look here. See that cell with 46 chromosomes? It does mitosis. Now we got two normal cells with 46. Look at this one. It duplicates, it does mitosis, but then the cell forgets to pinch in two. Forgets to pinch in two. Now well, we got 92 chromosomes in there. Those 46 duplicated. But the cell itself forgot to pinch in two. Now we got this big cell here. It's got 92 chromosomes in it. It's tetraploid. But this embryo would be, that's that mosaic I was talking about. This embryo would be a mosaic. You see that? It's a mixture of normal cells and tetraploid cells. So that's another way you could get tetraploidy. Sort of make sense? One more kind of chromosome accident. Un mas. Next page. Those of you who are art students, what is that? That's a mosaic. That's a mosaic, right? Yeah, that's a mosaic. Yeah, so in art, a mosaic. Did any of you guys in art class, like elementary school, junior high, or anywhere ever make a mosaic? Yeah. Out of like little pieces of different colored pieces of construction paper or something? Glass or a stained glass window or all right, this is an actual mosaic that dates back to the 200s to 300s AD. Worship the fish. What? What? No. All right, let me tell you where I took that picture. Um, years ago, I went on a trip to Israel. Ever heard of Israel? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. There's a, there's a fresh, big freshwater lake. In it's like seven miles long. It's called the Sea of Galilee. Or the Lake of Gennesaret. It's actually fresh water, but they call it the Sea of Galilee. Ever heard of it? Okay, and on the hills right, the grassy hills right around the Sea of Galilee, there's this little church building uh, that was built on the ruins of a small church building was built like in the uh, in the third century. So we're talking late 200s. 
And so these archaeologists found the, the foundations of it. Now, this little church building was only about the size of maybe, uh, maybe the size of this room. I'm trying to remember. Very primitive. So the, the archaeologists reconstructed it so that it would look like it looked in the 200s. Okay? And people in those days, they would build church buildings over sites that were important to them. Okay? Like if there was a site that their grandparents said something really important happened here, then they would build, if it was really important to them, they would build it like a church building over it. That's, that's what this was. So it's a real uh, kind of a crude building made out of stones and and up at the front there was an altar, okay? An altar made out of stones. And underneath the altar was this mosaic on the floor, this mosaic that was made by the people who lived there in the 200s. Um, so they were commemorating an event that was very important to them. So that's an actual mosaic. See, the archaeologists uncovered this mosaic on the ground and covered it and cleaned it up. And it's like, whoa, look at that. Um, two fish and a basket with five loaves of bread in it. Now, I don't know if you can see, they're round loaves of bread. There's four of them, but supposedly they thought, well, there's one inside there. Five loaves of bread and two fish. I thought, wow, that's really cool. I can use this picture of a mosaic in genetics class, make this trip tax deductible. No, I just didn't really do that. I didn't really do that. But I did take the picture there. Mm -hmm. And I didn't write off the expenses. I mean, I did more than just take a picture of a mosaic that I could use in genetics class. It was a tour. You all with me? Yeah. I just thought, man, that's a really cool mosaic. I can use that in class. So anyway, these people who lived in the 200s, you see, they made this mosaic. They took different pieces of colored pieces of stone and like cemented them together. I don't know. I just thought it was really cool. Okay. That's what a mosaic is in art. In genetics, a mosaic is an embryo or a baby or a person who is a patchwork of normal and abnormal cells. That, that's what a mosaic is in genetics. Um, do you remember when I said 95% of all Down syndrome cases are due to non-disjunction either in the formation of the sperm or the egg, right? 95%? 3% are due to translocation. The other 2% of Down syndrome cases are mosaics. Okay? Mosaics. And here's how it happens. Mosaic. An embryo that is a patchwork of normal and abnormal cells. Okay, so the places to take those. So let's look at this normal, normal fertilized egg. It's got 46 chromosomes in it. That's a normal fertilized egg. Watch, it's going to go through its first mitosis division and become a two-celled embryo with 46 chromosomes in each one. Is that normal so far? So far, so good, right? Now it's going to do mitosis again to make a four-celled embryo. And so watch, this cell is going to divide normally. There we go, 46 and 46. But this cell is, only, is going to undergo non-disjunction. It's not non-disjunction during meiosis. It's non-disjunction during mitosis. Non-disjunction during mitosis in the early embryo. So now we're going to get a failure of chromosome pair 21 to separate. We're going to get 47 chromosomes in that cell and 45 in that one. Uh, can you guys see that that's a 7, 40, 
seven. This cell has three 21s in it, three chromosome 21s. They failed to separate during mitosis. So now you've got an embryo that uh, looks like this. Now, in all likelihood, this, this cell that has 40, 45 chromosomes in it, it's gonna die. Because usually when a cell is missing a chromosome, an autosome, it dies. So now you've got this embryo, it's made of three cells. Two thirds of the cells in that embryo are normal, right? A third of the cells are trisomy 21 cells. Now, from this point on, chances are, these cells will faithfully reproduce themselves when they do mitosis. And we're gonna have a six cell, embryo made of six cells, and then 12, right? And so on. They double every time. And this, this cell of 47 chromosomes will faithfully reproduce itself every time it does mitosis. So eventually you're gonna have a baby that's born where two thirds of the cells in his body are normal and one third of the cells in his body are trisomy 21 cells. That's a mosaic. What would you predict would be the characteristics of such a child? Where, where two thirds of the cells in the body are normal and one third of the cells are trisomy 21. He may have a normal appearance, but he may also be um, as an effective, but like it could be like really shrinky, like I grew up with some of those things, so that it could work on Okay. So, some characteristics of Down syndrome, right? Yeah, and, and what else? I would say just a here, I'm not to be able to type Down syndrome. Right. Down syndrome that's not as severe. Yeah, Down syndrome that's not as severe. That, um, I hate to use the word case because it's not a contagious condition. A much milder case of Down syndrome. I remember, were you getting ready to say something? No. Uh, I thought out of the corner of my eye I saw your hands start to go up. I must be seeing things. I remember years ago, there was a couple at church who had a little baby with Down syndrome. The baby's name, what was the baby's name? Kevin, I think. I won't use the last name. Um, and as the child was growing, you know, baby, toddler, and so on, you could tell by looking at him that he had Down syndrome. You could tell. There was that certain phenotype. But he was learning at a, a much better rate than they expected. He was keeping up with all the other kids in preschool. and He was, he was learning almost normally. He wasn't as severely mentally handicapped as they had, had thought. And uh, as he grew, he was keeping right up with the kids in his class. I mean, he, he was doing pretty well. A little bit slower, but he was doing pretty well. And they had him tested at Riley Hospital. So they, at Riley Hospital in Indianapolis, you know, they did some karyotypes of cells from different parts of his body. And guess what? Some of the cells in his body showed normal karyotypes, and some of the cells in his body were trisomy 21 cells. This kid was a mosaic. Mosaic. So 2% of all the Down syndrome cases are, are mosaics, and this is how they form. Non-disjunction during mitosis in the early embryo. Actually, you were getting ready to say something. Right? Okay. okay. What? Yeah, in this example. But, right, you could have this mistake happen between the 4 and 8 cells, or between the 8 cell and 16 cells. So let's say it happens like the last day before they start differentiating. 
and you have like one like I don't know, sixty four tones is bad, how much of an impact would that have compared to this? Hardly any hardly any impact. Yeah. Do you think they would know? They may not even know. You know what? Last night when I was sleeping and my skin cells were doing mitosis, that's when your skin cells are doing most of your mitosis at night while you're sleeping. You're making new skin cells. So you literally do get your beauty sleep at night. You're making new skin cells to replace the ones that wear out. Last night when I was sleeping and I was doing mitosis, my skin cells, it's very possible that one cell, like maybe right here on the tip of my nose, underwent non-disjunction and created a trisomy 21 cell. I might have a trisomy 21 cell right here now. But it doesn't do me any harm because it's one cell out of 100 trillion. I've already gone through my embryonic development, right? Brain development and all that kind of stuff. It happens. It happens. Eli? So how in testing uh, chromosomes and making a carrier type, how do you know that, that the cell that you used was not malfunction? That's a good question. They'll do several cells, they, several replicates. Yeah, several. Okay, makes sense? Mosaics? Now, hmm. Gosh, you guys are paying attention the whole time. You look like you need a brain break. But you're not going to get it. Okay. All right. Now. Ah. Have I ever showed you my whip? No. I'll have to bring it up Wait a minute, is it the Indiana Jones one? Yeah, it's the Indiana Jones one. All right. I'll have to bring it up sometime. Okay, now, last time you guys went through all that computer tutorial stuff about, um, actually, beyond this, prenatal diagnosis, right? Pages 17 through 20 in the study guide. Yeah. You went through all that, right? Yeah. I'm curious, in the time that we've got left, does anybody have any questions about any of that stuff? Pages 17 through 20. All that stuff about prenatal diagnosis. Were there any of the questions in there that maybe you didn't get that you want to look at? Anybody? Quinn, are you okay? Go ahead and look, skim through pages 17 to, through 20. I want to see if there are any that you missed that you're not sure about, that you want to ask about. Any, anything in there? Yes, go ahead. Um, the amniocentesis steps? Oh, the amniocentesis steps. Yes. Okay, that's page 18. 18. Okay. Ah, yes. Okay. Oh, where you clicked and clicked and dragged things around on the screen. Yeah, that was so fun. Fun? You got to do amniocentesis. Yeah. yeah. You'd be surprised how long it took me to program that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I wouldn't. Oh, because I'm not a programmer. How long did it take for that whole tutorial? That whole tutorial? about 150 hours. Not just that one part on the amniocentesis, yeah. but all of it. It takes me a long time. Just for one tutorial? Average is maybe 100 hours per tutorial. Yeah. But at the time I was doing that, it was kind of a, almost like a hobby. It was just kind of fun to do. Computers are fun to do, right, Isaac? Yeah. It was like a creative outlet, but I mean, I haven't done it in a while. I probably don't even remember the language anymore. But I wanted you to at least see what amniocentesis is like. So who thinks they have the order here perfectly? Who's got the order? Uh, what, what, do you, what do you have? Just go ahead and number the list those in order. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, that's one. Wait, wait what? Oh, oh my gosh, that's so much easier. Yes, okay. go ahead. Read off here. Six, two, three, eight, four, seven, one, five. Oh, I did it. Seriously, I don't think you're out everybody has. Yeah. You know, I don't Okay. Like, well done. I got the All right, so oh, amni no, that was like <laughs> amniocentesis. Okay. Any other questions you want to ask about amniocentesis? I have a question. Is is there a risk with this procedure? Oh, a risk with any medical procedure. That's why you have to sign. Okay. What's the risk of maybe complications or accidental miscarriage or? Anybody know what the risk is? What percent? Like 21%. Pardon? Like 21%. Yeah, well, is that right? What's the percent? Is it 0.1? I'm sure it's not right. It was in the computer tutorial. Is there a place where you have to write down the risk? No. Is it like what? Where's the risk? I just asked at the end what was the best option out of the It's 0. 0.5. 0.5%? 0.5% risk. Is that pretty sure? 0.5% risk of something going wrong. Now, people have been doing amniocentesis for years now, and it's probably slightly lower than that now. But when you are pregnant and you get to age about age 35 34 35 at that point your risk of having a baby with a chromosome disorder is now slightly above the risk of something going wrong with the amniocentesis if you're 20 years old when you get pregnant your risk of having a baby with a chromosome problem is way less than the risk of the amniocentesis procedure, and that's why they don't recommend it for women under 35. If you're under 35, your chances of having a baby with a chromosome problem is less than the risk of the amniocentesis procedure. Does that make sense? If you're over 35, the risk of having a baby with a chromosome disorder is now greater than the risk of the amniocentesis procedure. Make sense why they don't recommend it if you're under 35? Okay. Um, that's kind of what it looks like. Actually, they use a plastic syringe now. That's what it looks like. Oh, you want to see a real one? Yeah. I've got a real one here. Oh. Real amniocentesis kit in this box. They sell them on eBay? Huh? They sell them on eBay? They don't sell them on eBay. Ye years ago, I called the women's clinic in Lafayette and I said, uh, I wanted to get an amniocentesis needle to show my students, okay? And so I talked to this lady on the phone at the women's clinic and I said, I said, do you guys have any, I told her who I was and that I, I, I said, I teach a human genetics course at Lafayette Jeff, and she goes, kind of set me back a little bit. She said, they have a human genetics course at Lafayette Jeff? Wow. No. I said, yes, of course. Anyway, so uh, I have a lot of pride in Jeff High School, you got to understand. So I said, yes. I said, uh, and I'm trying to get a hold of a used amniocentesis needle so my students can see what an amniocentesis needle looks like. And she said, there's this long pause on the other end, and she goes, well, we don't actually give away used needles. I'm sure she thought, why does this guy want needles? I, she said, well, we can't give away, we can't give away any used amniocentesis needles but we can give you a brand new amniocentesis kit that's never been opened. Genetics nerd, you gotta understand, okay? So I just drove over there during my prep period one day. They gave me this brand new shrink-wrapped amniocentesis kit. 
It had everything in it for doing amniocentesis. And I was so excited. Um, you had to be there. But I had to sign my life away. I had to sign several forms. Like one of them was where I would sign and agree not to let students use these needles and all that kind of stuff. So it was quite an adventure. But let me show you what's inside here. Okay, I've already opened up the kit, but this is the uh, packing list, genetic amniocentesis tray. You want to pass it around. And inside here, you got all kinds of things. Like, have you ever had like minor surgery without anesthesia, nope. where they cover you up with things like this? Oh, yeah. Sterile, it's kind of like paper, it's kind of like cloth. Got that? Any idea what this is for? Oh, the tummy. Tummy. This goes over your tummy. And that's where the needle goes in. <laughs> now, it goes like, well, I don't have a uterus, so you have to use your imagination. <laughs> like the bottom part? Below the belly button, right? But down there. Down. That's where the needle goes in. This is to keep everything sterile around the skin and everything sterile. And, um, oh, anybody know what this is for? It's like a little paintbrush. Pop popsicle. <laughs> yeah, it yeah, kind of looks like it. It's a sponge. Oh. Who knows, what's this for? Yeah, they, they put, they, they brush disinfectant on the skin to make it sterile. And then, um, oh, here's the label. They put the woman's name on here and her doctor's name. This is going to go on the tube of amniotic fluid that they collect. And... All right, now look at this. Check it out. Oh my God. That's not a huge needle. It's, it's like, it's thicker. That long? This is the needle they use to numb the skin and the underlying muscle layer. That's what this is for. That's not the big one. The big one is, Okay, here's the, there's the syringe, and there's the needle. Oh. Wow, it's a long one. Um, now, this, uh, okay, so the needle screws into the syringe like that, so that's, see, that's it. Can you see it? It's about, you kill someone. <laughs> See, it's that long between my forefinger and my thumb. Ooh. It's yeah. pretty long. Yeah. Now, <laughs> that is, that is, please excuse the interruption, but we want to take a minute to congratulate the marching band on a wonderful for, wonderful performance this morning at Lucas Oil Stadium and the Band of America competition. Wish them the best of luck as they head to the Scholastic State Finals tomorrow at Lawrence Central. And also to our boys cross-country team as they travel travel to New Prairie to compete in the semi-state and a chance to advance to the state finals next Saturday. Good luck to everyone. We hope everyone has a safe and restful fall break, and we'll see you back here on the 29th. Okay, despite, contrary to popular opinion, even though announcements have been done, we're not done. Okay, now, we're not done. I just want you to... <laughs> Anyone that writes bus number 65, today that bus will be 95. All right. Now let's regroup. Oh, Okay, now let's regroup. Okay, before we leave, now you can say you've seen an amniocentesis needle. It's got to be that long, remember, because it's got to go through the skin abdominal muscles into the uterus into the amniotic fluid so they can pull out 10 cc's of amniotic fluid guys check this out before you leave check this out this is a view through the microscope that tea colored liquid that's the amniotic fluid see the baby skin cells right here floating in there 
So they're going to go through that whole procedure you learned about in the computer tutorial to prepare those cells so that the chromosomes show up, so that they're metaphase chromosomes, and drop those cells on a microscope slide, the unborn baby's skin cells. And that's the microscope that, that I saw down at uh, Riley Hospital down at the Med Center. This is the cytogenetics labs, plural, cytogenetics labs down at the IU Med Center in Indianapolis. This microscope, made in Germany, about twice the price of my house. What? This microscope, made in Germany, about twice the price of my house. It's a finer microscope than what we've got in here. Could you live in that first bell? Wait, is this a SME all of us? Yeah, that's what they've been saying. Yeah, now guys, there's a camera built in here. There's a camera built in here, so they can automatically snap a picture of that metaphase spread. Looks kind of like this, or like that. Metaphase spread. And then a lab technician has to cut out those chromosomes from that photograph. This guy was hilarious. I asked him, this is at the IU Med Center, I said, do you mind if I take your picture? And he said, that'd be great. He said, wait, let me put on this white lab coat so I look real professional. <laughs> Did you take so, this picture or is this a stock? No, I took this picture. <laughs> so <laughs> it looks like it could be a stock photo. He, um, he's cutting out those chromosomes and making a karyotype. Actual, actual onboard baby chromosomes. It was normal. 